So next uh, presentation is for technologies for social augmentation in user embodied virtual reality. Uh, presenter is Daniel Roth from, uh, you came from Germany? Yeah, in Germany. Okay. Thank you for the introduction. I'm Okay, good day, they say here, I think. Um, thank you very much for having me. Um, in this paper, we um, report a little bit about uh, what we found out on technologies for social augmentation in, in VR. Um, and in this uh, collaboration with Gail Bente from Michigan State University and Kai Vogelei from <coughs> Forschungszentrum Jülich. I myself, I'm from the HCI group uh, in the, at the University of Würzburg. And it was also done together with uh, students of mine, Peter, David, and Chris Felix. So a little bit about the context, um, we are on the merge of becoming or being used as a communication medium and as we all know or as we see in, in demos and presentations, there's a, a strive toward more realistic re representation of uh, behaviors, especially communication behaviors, which you can see on the right, for example, facial expressions and also in the appearance of avatars. <coughs> However, and this is something that Holland and Stonetta um, found out or um, reported on uh, quite early on, 1992, in a Kai paper, um, a belief in the efficiency, efficiency of imitating face-to-face -face communication is an unquestioned presupposition of most current work, um, and further looking at non-imitative approaches that focus on underlying explored requirements and the distinct characteristics of the electronic media rather than on imitation of mechanisms of face-to-face -face might lead to even better solutions. So the, the idea is a little bit about thinking um, how, how can this media be used uh, aside from mere replication of um, behaviors. <coughs> and this is what we call um, social augmentations and, and some of these uh, motivations that we state for these augmentations are, for example, if we model the user behavior, if you model the social and communicative behavior, we could compensate for lacking sensory inputs, for example, um, or for transmission errors. Um, and this could also foster the inclusion of individuals with communicative disorders into the regard that people that have problems in expressing or interpreting um, uh, social behaviors um, might be uh, benefiting from such systems. Um, and by researching these social augmentations, we folks further um, get a more deeper understanding on the communication processes that happen in VR or in the context of HCI and XR. This is some examples of previous work on social augmentations. Um, uh, for example, the, the lab of Anthony Steed uh, considered um, gaze um, as a communicative behavior in, in shared environments and also the um, synth synthesis of uh, gaze behavior. Um, for example, on the upper right, you see an example of the works from uh, Jeremy Balenson, who um, uh, reported on a transformed social interaction, which basically thinks about decoupling uh, what physically happens um, uh, on the user behavior side and what is virtually represented. Um, in this case, um, they had a non-zero-sum gaze um, um, <coughs> approach, uh, which means that a, a speaker in a speaker scenario could um, direct his attention to multiple listeners. Uh, on the lower left, also early works from um, Stephen Booker, um, who considered uh, the dampening of facial expressions, so the real-time manipulation of facial expressions, uh, which is also considered on the lower right, um, with the manipulation of smile behaviors in, in, um, uh, in avatar-mediate communications. There's also some more abstract work. Um, for example, on the left side is the project by ourselves. Um, the users were asked to um, visit a virtual museum, um, and instead of um, replicating or synthesizing um, mere natural behaviors, we um, augmented these behaviors with uh, different visual transformations. For example, on the lower left, um, you see eye contact was not actually displayed um, on the avatar itself. Uh, with eyes uh, focusing somewhere, so, uh, but instead we rendered these uh, floating bubbles um, to, um, to uh, yeah, visualize um, directed gaze and attention. And on the right side you see a project by uh, Sinu, who is also here, um, that uh, considered the augmentation um, on, on the avatar as such. And we can already see <coughs> that, that these kind of um, systematics or 
uh, uh, yeah, affordances um, are, are used in, in consumer applications. So uh, on the top you see two very, um, yeah, I would say uh, big, um, big uh, games today, um, Overwatch and Fortnite. And there you can evoke uh, such emotes or um, yeah, uh, movements and also symbols um, by button presses or selections. And on the uh, lower side, you see how uh, different social behaviors and um, emotes and smileys are augmented in a social VR application. And on the right side, um, you see a t um, an image from a talk uh, from Oculus Connect um, in which they talked about synthesizing eye behavior, for example. So it is a, <coughs> a quite um, interesting topic to work in. And for this uh, related works, we could um, categorize uh, social augmentations into four, um, or four distinctions. Um, the trigger and target modalities, so the, the, the behavior modalities that are used to trigger um, such augmentations and display such augmentations. Then the phenomenolo phenomenological level is different, so is it uh, an augmentation that is based on a dyadic interaction or a group interaction. Um, then there's the question of the ecosystem of origin, so is this augmentation something that you would do in regular life, the social interactions, or is it something uh, that can only be present in VR, um, for example, smileys and so on, um, as well as the modification persistence. So the question is whether this uh, modification is persistent to the user that is embodied in VR itself um, as well, or is it only presented to uh, the communication partner? Now, what are, such, uh, what are requirements for such systems? First, um, uh, we are pretty sure that it's not going to work without um, multimodal sensing, so you least need at least um, two or more channels um, um, that are sensed to, to kind of figure out uh, when and, uh, and what to augment. Um, we need an automated status analysis, so uh, an analysis of the communicative interaction. Um, we need a social intelligence, um, so an artificial intelligence that actually decides when, when to augment, um, as well as a blending mechanism. Um, and further, this architecture should uh, allow for some flexibility to exchange and trigger uh, with different modalities. <coughs> Um, so this is what you probably all know or are familiar with. The user is um, tracked uh, with different sensing uh, techniques um, and the virtual simulation is displayed to the user. And as you can see, there's a couple of processes happening. Um, usually um, different sensor inputs are fused and probably also abstracted to what we call or introduced as an exchange model layer, so a layer that's actually capable of um, um, taking this uh, raw data, so to say, and, and mapping this on a, on a, a humanoid model. Um, and as well, as uh, we estimate the camera pose um, in relation to the, to the absolute and relative tracking space. And finally, this simulation is uh, presented to, to the user. Um, in our architecture proposal, we added uh, three components to this system. Um, the first component is uh, a status analysis component that basically takes um, data on a very low level, so um, more or less raw um, sensor input, analyzes, analyzes both the intra-modality status, so the status within uh, sensing data, um, as well as the status between uh, different sensing modalities. Um, the um, social intelligence and modification component um, takes this information then about the status of um, the, the, the user and, and uh, uses also the, um, the data of the other uh, person communicating with the user and um, decides upon whether an augmentation should be present and decides upon which augmentation should be performed. And finally, we, have, uh, we introduced a, a blending component that analyzes the current um, yeah, behavior process and blends, uh, um, blends uh, um, accordingly uh, to the simulation. Um, and synth this synthesized data is then rendered to the, um, to the um, user. <coughs> so this leads to a four-layer model. We have a, a very low-level sensing layer, an exchange model layer that also uh, already is um, kind of higher level and, and maps to, to humanoid uh, characters, so to speak. An augmentation layer that is 
more or less in parallel with this exchange model layer and the final simulation layer that is the rendered behavior. Um, as an example of this um, approach or how this can, can work out, um, I, I, I choose uh, artificial mimicry because artificial mimicry um, it's, um, it's well researched in psychology. It's uh, considering the mimicry, the, the mirroring of nonverbal behavior, um, as well as um, and it's affiliate and it's, well, it relates to affiliation and liking. So, if I like you very much, I, I, I mimic your behavior. I tend to mimic your behavior, um, and if you mimic my behavior, maybe we like each other more. Um, however, this is our yeah, usual test case for such uh, things because to model this is actually quite complex. You need to consider um, what kind of behavior is appropriate to mimic, uh, what timing, um, uh, what delay between the mimicking and, and when to mimic. <coughs> so this is a demonstration of our um, current prototype. Um, you see that uh, um, gaze, ex um, gaze behavior um, body motion and uh, facial expressions or low facial expressions are tracked uh, within this scenario. And I quickly pause here because on the left side you see uh, in the blue, this is the original motion that would be performed uh, by the left user. Um, and in the avatar model, so the colored uh, avatar model with the blue t-shirt, you see what's actually rendered by the system, which is different than the, um, the real behavior. Okay, so we, uh, we think a little bit about um, this process and how we can actually implement this um, in the community. I hope and this is visible. Um, so we have uh, more or less uh, three lines of, of data flow. Of course, we have the, uh, the raw data going to uh, sensor fusion and uh, post estimation of the camera in relation to the space. <coughs> um, but uh, this raw sensor data also goes through this um, analysis network. So we, uh, we can, for example, estimate the level of agreement by uh, checking how, how much nodding is apparent um, with an LSTM, or we uh, detect whether the person is speaking or listening, which is uh, typically very important in social interactions. Um, and finally, this data also goes to this exchange model layer, uh, which models already to, uh, or which integrates already a human pose model. Um, and gets the information from the remote client. Um, these behaviors are then merged and, and buffered, um, and different state machine layers, um, hierarchical state machines, decide um, upon the augmentation uh, um, as such. Um, this is a more detailed view about such a hierarchical state machine. Um, we have, uh, of course, different behaviors on the left side, the original behavior, and um, then some idle states that we need to transform and uh, the actual mimicry behavior, and in the mimicry state, there's a substate machine um, that basically decides upon which part of the upper body motion gets mimicked um, because we um, exclude, for example, something like complex, um, um, complex gestures or semantic gestures. Uh, with a complexity analysis, we don't want to, to mimic when you are listening to somebody, you seldom uh, move your arms like this, so this is a bit awkward. Um, and through a complexity analysis, we exclude such, such states. Um, we considered quite a few of uh, uh, blending um, uh, f uh, functions um, um, after, so four functions we actually evaluated um, and we found that uh, soft linear spline with one point si about 1.5 seconds is, uh, was perceived as, as best by, by our sample. Um, however, we also um, uh, adapt or slightly adapt the time in a, in a window uh, depending on the distance between um, the actual user behavior and what, what should be mimicked. So this is uh, a demo of the blending. <coughs> so on the left side you see the original behavior um, that is um, performed by the users. In this center you see a naive approach um, that does not consider complexity. And on the right side you see uh, what happens if we exclude complexity. Okay. Um, 
this is a non-evaluative uh, paper, so we, uh, I, I don't have any data to report, um, um, or we did not report any data in this paper. However, we performed um, a couple of evaluations of this, uh, what we call hybrid avatar agent approach, um, uh, for example, with uh, synthesized gaze and uh, mimicry, and also this more complex model of mimicry. Um, and the results um, are pretty much um, telling us um, the same thing, um, that natural behavior is the gold standard. So it's pretty difficult um, to, um, to actually beat us humans as we are, um, um, uh, as we are here, um, because we do a very good job in communicative processes. Um, however, what we find is that the more complex we develop this model and the more uh, sophisticated this is, um, uh, we find more similar ratings in the perceptual level of augmentation and uh, of uh, real behavior. Um, we need more data. Um, the problematic is that the, the analysis of this data is not so easy because every individual in the action uh, we perform is very individual, so people like each other or not, and depending on whether how they're liking is, they act differently. Um, and we would also like to um, test this, um, or this is more or less ongoing work, uh, test this with non-typically developed uh, persons, so clinical sample. <coughs> And during this work, uh, we also came across some uh, yeah, uh, upcoming challenges. Um, for example, um, this non-persistence um, of the simulation. So, so I do not see myself um, um, performing an augmented behavior. Um, this leads to a, pro a problem in the interpretations because uh, we execute some behavior, but the, the other user is presented uh, some, some uh, augmented behavior. Um, and this interpretation the other user takes is based on a synthesized behavior we are not aware of. So uh, we are not quite sure how to handle this and, and how to yeah, cope with this or um, how to come back from this loop. Um, but this is a problem uh, we are currently trying to solve somehow. Um, uh, we found that the blending needs additionally, um, yeah, a bit additional post solving. Um, as you have seen, maybe that uh, there is uh, collisions between uh, between the the mesh of the avatar. Um, this is a natural process that also happens if avatars are differently scaled um, in set in terms of, of measure. Um, but also for the blending, this is specifically important because we need to respect for the physical constraints. The third major problem is the differences in latencies and how they impact um, these social interactions. Um, especially the differences is a pretty difficult latency as such is, is a problem, but um, we also have differences, different <coughs> latencies in, in individual modalities. So speech, for example, uh, may be more delayed than body motion or less delayed, um, and, and gaze as well. And these, uh, these individual differences make it very, very difficult to find uh, general approaches to these augmentations. Um, we also thought about or had some ethical considerations, so how can we um, use this in actual applications, um, how, to m how can we make this more transparent to the user that such um, augmentations are performed. Um, it's actually uh, quite a difficult uh, thing to think about. Um, so if you, if you see Oculus, for example, um, including these uh, expressions and, and, and synthesized gaze, um, it's difficult to state uh, to what level the user should be aware of this. And also, um, yeah, how how yeah how much control you give the user o over such augmentations, and can you turn it off all the time, or do you see uh, that it's actually happening? Um, further privacy is a problem. Um, of course, we're talking about uh, yeah behavior as such, but also behavior we probably do not execute consciously. Um, so there's a level when when a machine actually knows uh, more about yourself than you do, especially when you're training um, social social intelligences. Um, <coughs> um, in the paper or in this in this line of work, we addressed some further problems, um, such as filtering, uh, filtering and um, yeah, correcting gaze data, and finding these constraints, which you can see on the lower lower left uh, when when avatars um, uh, act naturally or within natural limitations of humans. Um, we uh, included an. an an importer for avatars to actually use different avatars with the same um, exchange layer. And what we found very useful, uh, which you can see on the lower right, um, is a playback module. So we have an annotation and uh, playback um, module um, implemented quite early on, 
uh, because it's very, very important that you see how these augmentations actually perform um, offline before um, they can be tested in real time. <coughs> A little bit about future work. Um, of course, we want to perform more systematic evaluations um, on the impacts and benefits of such augmentations. Um, we are also considering neurophysiological correlates, so deriving um, emotional states or deriving behavioral states um, from um, brain-computer interfaces. Um, and the question we always get is about uh, how can you, can you model this with, uh, with uh, machine learning or deep learning? And the, prob the main problem is of this is um, that uh, we simply don't have enough data, um, communication processes, individual behavior is, um, is not so difficult to map, or it's difficult, of course, but um, it's much less difficult than actually mapping or uh, creating behavior for two people creating interactive um, behavior. So to conclude, uh, we presented an architecture for social augmentations that um, is based on three main components, a status analysis component, a decision-making component, and a planning component. Um, it's based on four data layers, a sensing layer, an exchange model layer, an augmentation layer, and a simulation layer. Um, and by this, we found this is quite uh, flexible in ma mapping different trigger modalities and different target modalities for the augmentation. Um, and it's also adapted to different behaviors um, for example, also to visual transformations. And with this, I thank you very much. This is a demonstration video about uh, some features of the current prototype. Um, we are also happy to share, so we um, share the current code base. We cannot upload this to GitHub because there's some third party um, dependencies, um, but um, we share this code base if you're interested in um, uh, having a look or doing a project. Be very welcome. Thank you. We have a plenty, plenty of time for Q&A. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Uh, I have a question uh, on your uh, control uh, and um, on your in the middle of your presentation. You yeah. say that uh, when someone is moving and someone else is moving, the movement of the first avatar is a, a mix between its own movement and uh, the movement of the other one. Yeah. Uh, if you apply that for the other, uh, for the two uh, avatar, uh, <laughs> what's uh, what's going to happen? Um, so, so we only do this, and that's why I said so. Um, um, let's say it's important um, to come back from this loop, or to come back from this endless synthesis. Um, so, uh, what we do is basically uh, we only uh, perform this uh, mimicking augmentation if somebody's speaking. So, if I am speaking, um, I. I would uh, personally not mimic somebody else, but I would perform get gestures. Um, so there's a possibility to uh, to mimic uh, my behavior onto the partner's avatar, so to speak. Okay, the speaker so become the yeah. reference. Exactly. Yeah, okay. So okay. Say. Thank you. But that's that's actually the problem with the with this with this loop, right? When to come back and when to uh, fit in. I wonder if you've thought about. Um, culture, cultural differences with this um, mirroring. Um, it's not the, the same thing, but in some other work that actually compared um, Japanese participants versus German participants, there was a big difference in terms of how far apart. So what you're showing on the screen now, even that, that distance that you should stand apart was quite different. And I imagine there's some cultural things about what is appropriate to copy or not to copy or whether um, yeah, they're, they're, you know, interpreted in the same way. Yeah. So, so um, I would totally agree. There's a lot of cultural differences in uh, nonverbal behavior in general. Um, unfortunately, the literature does not provide so much information for computer scientists to actually, yeah, do the implementation. So even with, uh, we had to dig a lot into this literature to actually find some reference number and on how much time is between. Um, executing the behavior and being being mimicked, so um, it's quite well researched, but not on the parameterization we would need to to yeah to further proceed with this. Um, but I would agree that yeah, cultural differences would be something to tackle definitely in this in this part. I have a one question. Uh, you have a, a 
um, repeating, sorry. Some sensing and decision and planting kind of status. <coughs> so I think there might be some issue for latency when you plan. And yeah. then, so do you have any uh, 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 command for the latency for your system? So, so the, the good thing about, so yeah, we have uh, the latent numbers are reported in the paper. The, the um, basically the, the own simulation latency is about, I think, um, 80 to 100 milliseconds usually for the body tracking. Um, it's, I'm not entirely 100% secure, but something like 150 milliseconds for the facial tracking and about 200 milliseconds for the eye tracking. Um, and speech is, um, speech is worse um, if you use, um, so in these tests we also or, uh, almost always perform this in a local setting, uh, but if we uh, test uh, in distributed settings, speech is, speech is a problem. Um, with regard to, for example, mimicking this behavior, it's not such a big problem because we uh, queue this anyway, so we buffer this behavior anyway. There's a slight delay between um, your own execution and, and being, being mimicked. So this is not such a problem, but uh, the differences between each modality and the differences and the problems with latency we have anyway for the self embodiment, um, it's a crucial part, of course. Thank you. But the network, the network, um, for example, with the remote uh, transmission, the network does not add up that much um, latency. So, so for us, um, it's like the, the network transmission is like four milliseconds or so. So in a local setting, this doesn't add, add, add up much. But of course, if you are in Australia and I'm in Germany, this would be a problem. <laughs> so any other questions? Thank you for your presentation. I think this is really a fascinating area and the, uh, the opportunity to generate plausible uh, social behaviors when maybe you can't detect that or something I, is very useful. But I find myself wondering, in contrast to your 2018 paper where you visualized eye contact by using shaders instead of, that was making apparent real behavior. Yeah. Where this is infer making apparent behavior that may not actually exist. Yeah. Uh, and I, I worry about, do you have any thoughts on whether this will actually lead to more misinterpretation and more difficult social interactions rather than making it easier or making it more transparent? So maybe, um, so this is a, um, a video of the old paper. Um, I would totally agree, it's, it's um, if we are in a pretty strong gray zone there with regard to um, yeah, how, how, yeah, how we actually, how truthfully we actually should replicate this behavior. Um, but the motivation for these real behaviors is actually also um, um, really to think about how can we, um, for example, also help people that have problems in interpreting and expressing behaviors. Um, so it's not it's it's a little bit about hacking humans, but on a, on a, with a positive motivation. Um, I would agree that it's it's difficult to to argue that the machine should take over our execution of social behaviors. Yeah, it's, I don't have a counter argument for that or something. Discussed. It's, it's an important point, and and we are thinking about writing a, a, a paper on ethics to this regard. Um, be welcome to to join. Um, I think it's in the end something um, ap application developers have to uh, decide themselves. Um, but we see this, and we see this also happening in commercial applications. Um, and it's difficult to say that the, we can put up a warning sign and say don't do it, because it will happen essentially. I think it's also our job to reflect on it and to, to think about how we can make this yeah, more transparent. Um, allow the user to stop it when it's necessary, allow the user to see the process, allow the user to understand um, what happens to his data and so on. So. Thank you. Last question. Uh, also, um, 
I was thinking it's very important what the context is when you're going to use the mirroring. And in the context of counselling, for example, where, um, so, so if it was two friends talking and one is telling you something sad, then you should look sad. You, you shouldn't look, you know, happy about their misfortune. But in a counselling context, what happens is, and this is through work that we've been doing to confirm this, that it's not so much, so when you're conveying empathy, for example, often empathy is conveyed through mirroring, but in that context, the counsellor actually remains smiling and positive the whole time and is you know, not actually going to mimic what, what the patient is doing. So, um, yeah, it's quite important also to consider Abs the particular... Yeah, consider the context. And so this is also variables that we have to integrate in this model, of course. I think this is super important. Okay, last thing to the speaker again.